Tonight's subject is love and yours. I made you a promise when I started. Everything I tell you on this platform, I know from experience. I am not theorizing. When we are told, he who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. The Apostle John was not speculating. This is not a conclusion that he reached after years of philosophic contemplation. This was an act of God in self-revelation. God had never revealed himself as infinite love to man. I doubt that man could ever, with all the philosophy of the world, ever come to the conclusion that God is love. God is love. In spite of all the horror of the world, I tell you, true, I know that from experience. But if another apostle tells us that though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a something brass or thinking symbol. Then he takes all the gifts of God and compares them to love. And if love is not present, I am as nothing. I may have all the wisdom of the world, all the power of the world, everything in the world. If I have not love, it is as nothing. There is no gift of the Spirit comparable to love. And in the end, love is the only thing that really will abide, abide forever. Faith will be realized. Hope will be realized. These are attributes of God. But God is love. He's not an attribute of God. God is love. When you stand in the presence of the risen Christ, you have no other emotion in the world, no other vision. It's simply love. God is love. And when love embraces you, it's only love. And you wear the body, which is the body of the risen Christ, and it's only love. So everything else will pass away, but love will endure forever. So he who does not love, does not know For God is love. Tonight I will tell you certain things that seem incredible. They're all scriptural. And all of these, may I tell you, are true. We are told, let us be persistent in the race as we run it, let us be persistent in this race, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was to be realized by him endured the cross, despising the shame, embraced the cross, despised the shame. I know that to be true. When he nailed himself upon this, I know that to be true. And despised the shame to which you have to go as the speaker. When he did it on you, he embraced it willingly with a joy and despised the shame which he knew he would have to go through. And that was love. So tonight the things that I will tell you, all from scripture, you wonder how can anyone hear this one? He who drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Well, I have a very large selection of Bibles at home and commentaries and of many scriptures.
colorfully lit. The exegesis is on all kinds of the 66 books. I have read one where it has been grasped as me. They cannot believe it could be taken differently. But may I tell you, these statements are expected to be taken literally and fulfilled literally. I drink the blood of God. He who drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. It doesn't make sense, does it? And that's why Myers in that lovely poem which he called St. Paul. Oh, could I tell? He surely would believe it. Or could I only say what I see? How can I tell? Or how can you believe it? How? Until he bringeth you where I have been. Until you see this temple split in two and the liquid golden light at the base of the spine. And as though you put a sponge upon it and every drop is absorbed. You look upon it and the word drink or to eat the flesh or drink the blood is to find in the concordance as to do it with enjoyment. It's the most impulsive thought in the world if you take it on a certain level. May I tell you, the concordance is right. When you look at it, there's nothing but joy in your being because you say within yourself, I know it is myself. O oh, my divine creator and redeemer. And then coming closer, you fuse with it, absorbing it every little drop like a sponge. And then up like a spiral light into heaven. I will raise you after you have taken my blood. He who drinks my blood, I will raise him up at the last day. And the last day is not some day in the remote future. It comes every moment of time to the individual. This thing has happened. But it is still, in a sense, happening. Look to him, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was to be, I was say, realized by him, embraced the cross, endured the cross, and despised the shame. Everyone will simply have that experience. And when you drink it, it's sheer enjoyment. You don't absorb it with the tongue. I don't put it to my mouth and drink it. I look at it, and I know with the infinite joy it's my very being, my creator and my redeemer, and I fuse with it and absorb it as a dry sponge would that pool of golden liquid light. And then he tells you, I will raise you up after you have drunk my blood. And I will raise you up at the last day. And up you go right into heaven. So how to tell it? If one can only tell it, I know there are those who would believe. But how to tell it? If one could receive. Here in New York City, this past summer, I always call on my friend who has run this wonderful bookstore over the years. In fact, most of my library have bought them. She was only interested in money. I was going to sell my book because she made a dollar. She had no interest whatsoever in anything I wrote in the books. She had an habitless diet of metaphysical books. She didn't know the contents of one of them, but she knew where every one was and the price of living. And if she knew your interests and you started in a certain direction, 
She can divert you for a moment while she'll take that book out and rub out the parts of another parts. <laughs> I never corrected her. I caught her doing it with me. She always did it to my wife when my wife went in looking for certain books for me. She knew she would never question the price if she had the book. And she would do it. Well, I were going and she would say, oh, devil, you certainly do dream, don't you? I said, Mary, these are not dreams. These are visions, parallel description of the devil. And she turned to something else. If I were taught politics, which I did, if I were taught money, with her up, I did, then she would have all the ears. But when I began to tell her of a vision, of an experience of mine, Mary had no time for it all. And this goes back into the 20s. So this year, as is my custom, I thought I'd go and call her Mary. And I say to a friend of mine, for the one night, I haven't had time as yet to go and see Mary. I think I'll go to more. She said, haven't you heard? She said, no. And Mary was killed that month. Killed instantly. And there is no more metaphysical library. It used to be called the Gateway. She and her husband had no children, were married for 40 odd years, and they went their separate ways. They made lots of money, Mary ran the bookstore, and he lived in the home of the country in Bucks County. There are so many artists and writers living in Pennsylvania. So they would call each other if someone needed something. If she needed someone to go hunting for their books, she'd call Bill and they would take the training or riding and do whatever Mary needed. And she occasionally go out to the house. So they never had any feeling that she should call and freely inquire. There's no reason for it, so they thought. So many days went by, and he called. He wanted some help, and there was no response. He called all through the day, both the shop and her home in the village on 18th Street, and there was no response. So he came on in, went to the home first, with the, all the uncollected mail. The neighbor said, we haven't seen Mary in five days. He went to the shop, right off Madison Avenue and 60th, and here, uncollected mail, and they hadn't seen Mary in five days. He had affairs of Mary five days before. He did something from the grocery store, and it was late. It was just the end of the block. So she went out with a little bit of change first and no identification mark. Nothing on her, but her little change first. Stepped off the curb and the truck moving at tremendous speed, and she was gone instantly. So Bill went down to the police department and inquired about this missing wife of his. And they said, you know, have you tried them all? He said, I'm a part of her dead wife. I'm telling you, my wife is missing. She had been missing for five days. And the cop said to her, after all these things happen all day in New York City, you just describes a woman just like your wife, and she's at the mall. Why don't you go and look? So Bill goes to the mall, and there's Mary, unclaimed for five days. Not one moment could I arrest her attention as I have yours now. Mary made a considerable sum of money out of me. That's all she wanted. And I would have given her any day that I visited, I would say four or five days a week. I'd go browse in her life. The most wonderful benefits for life. I think that and the one in Long Beach are the two outstanding libraries in this country that I know. The one called Acres of Books in Long Beach. Well, these are the two fantastic libraries. Mary made this quick departure from this level unprepared, not knowing one word of the great mystery of life. And she had every opportunity over the years to hear from one who had experienced scripture, and Mary wouldn't take it at all. We are told at the very end of his days, Paul turned to Mary, and he spent it from morning to night, trying to persuade all who would listen to him about Jesus, and using as his argument 
the laws of Moses and the prophets and the songs. And many were convinced by what he said, while others disbelieved. Or Mary did he even give me the chance to disbelieve. Because it leads to her all sheer facts, all the time. And I tell you, every precept in that book called the Bible is literally true and will one day be experienced by you and fulfilled by you literally, even to the drinking of the blood. And it's not blood that I would cut my veins. But when you see it, you know it's the only living reality in the world. It's that which made you alive while you walked this earth. It was the blood of God. And because God became, I may become God. When I was serving to, there was the blood that gave me life. And on that blood, I knew it was myself. For in the blood, there is life. Life is in the blood. Golden liquid living life. And you saw it. You become one with it. And then as you're told, then I will raise you up after you drink my blood. And all the scholars can get out of this statement is, if I would only read his words and assimilate them and begin to understand them, well then I am eating his flesh and drinking his blood. You will do it literally. I'm not saying you should not understand them. And that is the lowest aspect of what is intended. That is intended to be taken literally and experienced it. He that drinks my blood has life. Now he said, because I live, you will live also. See the difference in tense? He is completed. Because I live, that's present, you will live also. He's telling everyone that he addresses. And this is in the 14th of John. That though you seem to be alive, you're really not. Not yet, not until you drink my blood. But I have animated you, for I have put my blood with you. Unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again, and thou with me. So he dies by crucifying himself on me on you, on everyone. So his blood is in me. But I did not drink until he severed me in two. And then as he severed me in two, I absorbed it. Absorbing it was complete drinking of every drop of blood. And then on the heels of it, you are sent like a serpent, but that's a boat of spiral light. Just as you are told in Scripture. So here I tell you, love endures. It was love. You can take the word Jesus in scripture, it means God, it means Jehovah. And it means love, for that is the nature of God. That's the ultimate reality. So if you read it, you can say love. If the word Jesus offends you, say love. And love says so and so and so, that's all right. And Jesus said so and so, say love. Same thing. Jesus is love. Infinite love. Now here, I asked you for your case history. I want to thank you for the six that have come so far. I will use them as the evening permits. One I will use tonight. And the lady gave it to me. She said it happened to her on the night of the 4th of September this month. She said that I fell asleep and my body lay asleep on the bed. I found myself looking for something. I didn't know what it was that I should find. But there I am looking and looking for something. I had to find something. But what it was, I didn't know. Until in my hand, a pair, my left hand, three coins. And I said, not to anyone, just speaking aloud in the dream. Should they not be 30 pieces of silver? And the voice answered and said, No. You have the three 
precious ones. And they, as the boy spoke, the three were taken out of my head towards the right, one by one, each seven. And as the hand took the first one out, the boy said, this is faith. Took the second one out, said, this is hope. Took the last one out, said, this is doubt. And then I awoke. There is the fulfillment of the 13th of Corinthians, first Corinthians. Faith, hope, and love, these three abide, but the greatest is love. Faith will one day be translated into vision, therefore fulfill itself. And hope will be completely realized in the state. But love endures forever. It's something that's basic, you can't analyze it. It's something that's altogether God. There's only God, and God is love. So she held the three coins, the three precious ones in her hands. And she thought in terms of a 30 pieces of silver. And the boy said, no, you have the three precious ones. And then came, and the voice, as she relinquished, she didn't have any choice in the matter, he just took one after the other. And the voice began to speak. So whenever vision breaks out into speech, the presence of deity is affirmed. As told us in the third chapter of Exodus and the sixth of Isaiah, when it breaks out into speech, when you're in the presence of vision and speech takes place, then the presence of deity is affirmed. So I say every word of scripture you one day will experience. I have experienced scripture. I have experienced it, and now, night after night, all the lovely things that come after us, like the 23rd Psalm, who would have thought you took that pleasure? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Would you believe that is definitely true for a man to experience? For the last few years in New York City, we were warned not to walk through the park, Central Park. There were muggings day and night. They said you took your life in your hands and you entered the park. Professors from Columbia were murdered. Bing, the head of the Metropolitan Opera, he was mugged and stripped with all his money gone right at the very beginning on 59th Street as you entered. And this is when the lights are on, only at 10 at night. But I felt, regardless of all these rumors, I must go through the fog. And so I got my daily walk, and I started through the fog. And I can't tell you how green the grass was. That luscious, luscious green. And it was so thick. And for years, New York has suffered from the lack of rain. And they wouldn't need to walk in the restaurant. When asked for it, and they had little signs in the hotels, please do not keep the water running. Only use it when you have it. And they asked for all kinds of very pertinent things about don't touch the toilet unless you have it. And all these things to save water. It was down to almost 50% of the best. Well, in the last year, for some wonderful reason, the rains came and the grass was so green. I can tell you my clue as I walked through the farm and remarked to myself how green the grass is. The following night, this was my experience. I saw my earthly father. He looked about 50 years old. He died when he was 85 in the year 59. But he looked about 50 and radiant and rose. And I was lying on the grass, back on this wonderful stretch of green, luscious grass. And I said to him, I said, isn't this strange? Only yesterday, I had a dream. I had a dream that I saw this grass 
and remarked to myself how clean it was, how altogether comforted and wonderful it was. And now, here, it is an objective reality. It's a fact. Last night in my dream, it was subjective. And now here, it is objective. And it appeared to smile. What is objectivity? And what is subjectivity? Is it not wholly determined by the level on which consciousness is focused? I am telling you, in a dream, that this is the reality. And what I experienced only yesterday was the dream. And I told them how I had dreamed it. And when I woke back here, I realized from this level what I told him was the dream. And what I told him was the dream was really the fact. Which was the fact and which was the reality. Now who is my father? We are told in scripture, the whole vast world is seeking the Father. And Christ tells us, I am the Father. He who sees me has seen the Father. The whole vast world is seeking Christ. They are seeking the authority that is imaged as your earthly Father. That seat of authority. That seat of power that you can trust, that you can respect, that power to which you can, be, you can submit yourself, even if it does, and it does sometimes, chase you. And in doing so, you think it's afflicted. But still you will submit to it if you can trust it. And what is it? It's the power in our very self that we are seeking. That same power that the Christ of the Gospels claimed himself to be. So when I met my father, I was only seeing the authority that I had found. He was the image, the symbol of that authority that I loved. I always trusted him. I would always submit myself. He was always generous and kind. And here I am, stretched out on the rest, in complete fulfillment of the 23rd Psalm. We make it be to lie down and eat that too, the Lord. But we're told in Scripture, Christ is the Lord. And he calls himself the Father. Here's my Father. And I'm lying down, not standing on it, I'm lying down and eat that. And it's so green and so luscious. And night after night, the entire book unfolds as experiences. After the four major ones take place. Or they're taking place. It's all behind me now. So I'm sharing with you, and to repeat it, how can I tell you? And anyone, I wouldn't say anyone, but the majority, we see How until he brings them where I have been. He takes them to that same level, and then they will know. And they will know all these precepts are to be taken literally and fulfilled why well, tell you God, who is love, endures. Everything is going to pass away. He will simply wither like the grass and simply vanish from the earth. And the earth itself, God, by being you, are completely incorporated to the one being who is God. There is nothing but God. And God is all that. Everything else is an attribute of God. Faith will be fulfilled. Hope fulfilled. All the attributes fulfilled. But God is done in Joe's breath. It is breath. So here this wonderful story <coughs> of the three coins. But I can tell you my thrill that someone who comes in will have a deal of that nature. And he would share it with you. He very sweetly wrote it out in a type written form and gave it to you. And others I have, I have five others, and they're perfectly marvelous. And when I come that they're fit, I shall share it with you. And so again I'm going to make an appeal. 
do share your experiences with me. They encourage everyone. This sweet lady who wrote it, her message has gone out tonight to everyone who is here. And you will know that you too will have a similar experience. I know that these three qualities, these virtues, they abide. And the greatest of these is in last. And the best is first. And the first is last. Best was not. Comes out of him best. And these you have the three precious ones. Not the thirty pieces of silver. The price of him who could go bad by what he said. Well, that's the price you pay the owner of the ox. If the ox go to stay, you pay the owner of the slave, not the slave. You pay the owner of the slave, thirty pieces of silver, if you had the ox. And the ox is a symbol of Christ. And Christ comes to go there. He simply goes in into you like that ox they call the lamb of the life in Scripture. An ox goat. And it goes into moving on to higher and higher levels of the witness. So when he comes, he does the peace. He brings the sword. He brings the ox goat. And so when the ox goes someone, one injured, well then a third piece of silver will be given to the owner of that slave. And so he wonders, are there not 30 pieces of silver? And the voice answered, no. Three. And you have the three precious ones. These are the three. When you stand in the presence of the risen Christ, the only precious ask is to name the greatest thing in the world. And you do name the three. And you also go on to say, but the greatest of the three is love. And that's when love embraces you and you become one with love. And forever, you are one with the body of life. And there's no divorce. But God is now joined together. You and I are one. No man or organization of men could put asunder. You're one with the body of God. And forever, you are that one. So when you read this prayer in the not distant future, after that experience, <laughs> you're awakened as the very being the whole vast world talks about. While it springs it and they can come in this, for the God made on this devil is simply veiled protection. While a veiled protection, no one sees the body that we wear. And so they have to simply guess at the reality behind what you have said. How can I bring God to God? How can God have God? For God is true. How can I eat his body? How can I lie down with these natural? And Naya of Green Passion tells me, I am protected forever. It's the story of God's protection of his anointed one, his event. So you're told he actually allows me to lie down with Green Passion. Or what? He tells me, the very beginning. It's all because from now on, no concern about where it comes from. No concern of anything in the future. Just I will let you fly in green fashion. An abundance of joys from now on. Just for the taking. And then you go on to the people. If I were hungry, I would not take. For the world is mine. And all the world. The cattle of a thousand heroes are mine. And so were I hungry. I will slay an evil. Why tell anyone of my mind if the world is mine? Well, you have an inheritance that is infinite, that is unspoiled, unfading, when these things begin to happen with you. And the minute you drink the blood, you are raised. And the whole story begins on the resurrection. There will be no Christianity without resurrection. And resurrection without Crucifixion is sin, sheer nonsense. How could there be a resurrection without death? For well, God dies, and that's his love. For you, it's love for me. Lest I die, thou canst not live. For if I die, I shall arise again. And 
now with me. Not as two, as one, yet without loss of identity of the one who I raise. No change of identity. No change to that wonderful specific individuality. The same self, yet now including a far greater self and before, who is none other than God the Lord, Jesus Christ. To include him and yet remain the being that I am, yes. Without change of identity, you encompass this infinite presence who is Jesus Christ. And you are without change of identity. That's the mystery. And the aim only Jesus. Nothing but Jesus. And you are Why can you love in yours for that? As told us in the 13th chapter of Corinthians. Everything will pass, but love endures all. Some wonder by the three virtues, faith, hope, and love. Faith as believing what is incredible. Hope is hoping when all things are hopeless. And love is forgiving what is unforgivable. That's love. But everything that you've ever done is forgiven. If I had to expiate my past, as the world teaches, one must, I could never be exonerated, not in eternity. But in that embrace of love, though my sins were there at that moment like scarlet, they were at that very moment made white as snow. And there was complete divine acquittal of all that I had ever done. And I did everything that man could ever do. I had everything that man was capable of doing, I did up to that moment. And he embraced me and it sunk me. And I was divine. And my sins that were then like stone became white as stone. No one can really, he says, save himself. We are saved by the grace of God. It's not your own doing, so there's no way to boast the grace of God. Now tonight, take this, we're called upon to imitate God as their children. Now tonight, here is how I would imitate you, where I do. It's told us in the first epistle of John, the fourth chapter. We learn because he first loved us. Because implies causation. Our love is response, only response. The cause is God loved me first. Now that apostolic we must now become a personal art. I am because God first loved me. Now imitate God as a dear child, as I'm told in the visions. Start to love. I want a response to love, but I start loving the one I have respond. I expect it to come from there, and I don't initiate it. I will wait in vain. I'll wait forever, for I must imitate God as a dear child. Well, I am told, because I live, you will live also. That's why must be day. I live, therefore you will live also. See the change in tense? Pygmalion and Garatia, she did. The creation of the great artist, Pygmalion. She prayed at marvel. And to whom does he pray to make her alive? He prays to the goddess of love and asked the goddess would make her an that he could embrace her and find affection and find a companion in his creation. And love responds. And when love responds, 
Galatea on this uh, first word is to call a creator thing. And she calls out the big me. Well, the first word I ever uttered and you ever uttered is to call our creator thing. Before I could say anything or see anything, though I couldn't utter the words, I had to be aware of being before I could become aware of being aware of something. I had first to be aware of me before I could be aware of anything. So although I couldn't use words, I was about to talk, you, maybe. No matter what, I became aware of my hand moving before my eyes. But I had to be aware of being first before I could be aware of a hand or whatever it was moving before my eyes. And so a little child is first aware of being before it becomes aware of anything in this world. So here the first word that the child is really uttering is the name of its creator. Because to be aware of being is saying in the depth of one being, I am. If I am, then I'm aware. And so I must first be before I can be aware of it. And so as Galatea became aware, she calls her creator's name, and she calls out the name. Here is simply an aspect of this eternal vision. So, if I must imitate God, and the initiative is with God, and I now love because God first loved me, for the imitating, my name, I'm aware of being, and I want someone in my world to respond, to appreciate what I do, and to express that appreciation, or well, then I must start loving. I must start expecting that appreciation and go beyond it and hear it as though it's true. I must listen just as though I heard what I would hear were it true. Then comes the response, for the world is but an echo. The world is only a response of what you are doing. So when I am not loved, then I am not imitating God as a dear child. I am expecting it to originate there. It can't originate there. It has to originate in me. So the whole vast world and myself pushed out. And if God is not, then I love Him because He first loved me as imitating Him. Well, then I see the whole vast world of love. But now I want the world to respond. In what kind? I want to say to my brother Victor, who has made a fortune in this world, a little tiny island called Barbados. You could put four Barbados in Los Angeles and still have room. And he has made a considerable fortune. And he's starting behind the eight ball. And he said to me, you don't have a body will you leave. Maybe you will. And they say, what is the spirit of your success? They think because I have mine, I love mine, I don't have mine. Oh yes, I have it, I have made this. But I don't have money. I love the use of money. But if I told you what I consider my success, and the secret of my success, maybe you will believe it, maybe you won't, others don't. Because being a successful businessman, they're afraid of him. And they think he's hard. They think he's everything that he's not. And this is what he told me. And what do you think he said? He said, my secret is this. I love people. Now they're all afraid of me because I have money. I am never too busy to see anyone. Regardless of pigment of their skin, they can survive to hear anyone coming in. If Churchill came, when Churchill was alive and he came, he was sitting in the same seat that my portal would come in. I thought it was a seat in my bed. And I really love him. And so, he's done it all through the meeting. By giving, he's always giving. Not thinking of himself, just at the beginning. But he makes a fortune, and he can't stop it. It pours and pours and pours. And he does it his secret is because I love him. 
Now, he doesn't know the Bible, as you do. He certainly doesn't know it as I do. But innately, he knew that God is love. And I love because he first loved me. How he got that I don't know, but he just loves people. And people have to bring in all kinds of information that you can't buy in any other way. He finds all kinds of deal because people love it. And yet they're afraid of it. Just as men, not knowing the unknown, is afraid of God, who is in the love. If you ever saw the risen Christ, you wonder how God ever in Germany have ever been afraid of God. When there's not a thing in the risen Christ but in for the love. Nothing but love. And yet man fears this unseen. You can't see him until he calls you. He hides his face because you went astray and simply served another God and played the harlot with one who was not God by worshipping some false God. Call it by any name, but it's only God. And if you go back one day, he will not hide his face anymore, he will unveil it. And you will see him come down, he'll embrace you, and then you will leave. And the union is complete, and no one can suck it. So tonight, you take me in my way, and tell you what I've experienced. You start tonight, and all right, fall in love with being successful. And success, you always need, the state always needs a man to express it. And so, a man will express it. They'll come into your world, fall in love with being successful. And then men will come and will be successful. Without the effort you think it will take. All these things work almost without effort. If you really believe in God. And imitate him because of their time. I tell you, everything in the world that we now hold so dear will all pass away. But love will not pass away. Because love is God Himself. Now let us go to the south. Or sing. I think you will find the story that I will tell on Monday, a very fascinating story. Based upon a little that I received, which He doesn't know as yet how perfectly it fits in with the visions, my own personal visions, over the past, I would say, 20 years. She may not be here tonight, I can't tell her she's here. And she may not even come on Monday, that's really mad. But what she wrote in this past week, and how perfectly it fits with the vision that I will tell on Monday. Is this drama secular or sacred? Are there any questions? Yes, last, uh, last week now you, you said to uh, seek him out and brood over him. Would you expand on that? Well, if you took what I said tonight, and not just drop it because it's over and you open the door. Root over what you heard. So I'm giving these words. So when I quote scriptures, all prophets were inspired by the same script as told us in the Epistle of Peter. So when we read the four Gospels, like for the night of the book of John, he who drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. But well, these are his words, and his word is himself, so rule over that. Rule over everything that he said. His precepts are to be taken literally, and he dwells in you, Bill. But tonight I have explained, based upon my own experience, of what it means to actually drink the blood of God. And the word translated, drink, means with enjoyment. It's not a repulsion. And you can't conceive of anything more repulsive than the orthodox 
few blue mind than the taking of blood. For the simple reason they are trained in orthodoxy. That the animal must be trained of all that for life is in the blood. And put blood, but that's what we public. They kill the chicken differently from the heathens slaughter the chicken. And they will slag the board and drain all the blood from the animal. So I get all the blood. A race that I was in a Christian environment, we put blood sausages. And well, uh, rare roast beef. And things of that sort. And after drain the blood. So it has anything to do with that level. It's something entirely different. When they know what that blood is, or when the Christian knows what that blood is, what Christian would take it that he would even, even entertain the thought of drinking the blood of Jesus? He wouldn't, would he? I'll take this in remembrance, I'll think of the wine. That's not the blood. That is a symbol, a shadow of what will give the real enjoyment when they see that blood. And it'll absorb every drop. There's no time at all. And you do it real. You're so thirsty for it. And you've solved the whole thing you're in. Now there's life in you. He who drinks my blood has now eternal life. Now I'll raise him up. And from this generation, you're turned around into regeneration. And you're raised up through the drinking of the blood. So I said, Bruno, Bruno had that very thought tonight. In the hope that in the not distant future, you experience it. And then hope one day will be realized. Have faith in it, that will be realized in the actual experience, but love cannot pass away. Any other questions? Well, you have told us that two times we all are the heart. Otherwise, we couldn't understand how what causes people to be the same. Then you tell us that the heart is the greatest part of the heart. It is common from the true religion. Like such as other religions. But first of all, what man has not defaulted from the true religion? What? If you go to the highest by any name, you said the Pope. If you said the Archbishop of Kenton, if you spoke the highest in the Presbyterian world, there's not a name of bishops or popes, but they still do have heads in that teaching. Or you go to any the great Sanhedrin, they're all the parties of the true God because they don't turn within themselves. We see that I am the fundamental thing is not to believe. I am unless you believe that I am he, he died in your sins. And so when they can cross themselves with everything on the outside, for the benefit of a seeming other, then they departed from the truth. They're not serving the one true God. Called by any name, and don't care what how they justify it, they are not serving the one true God, the faith of heart of heart. Another word is used in the scripture for the heart. It's called the sinner. And when he became the friend of the sinner, that was the prostitute. In the sense that you and I understand the word. And yet, she was the one who wept. And so filled his feet with water. She could wash it when the Pharisee, who was always on the outside, he washed the outside of the cup, that he did not give him water with which to wash his feet when he, the guest, came to die. Yet she came in, and in her tears she washed the feet. And she did, he did not anoint the head, and she with her little. And he wondered, how can this man be a prophet? If he were a prophet, surely he would know what sort of woman she is. For he tells him, she is a sinner, but he also knows her what sort of woman. He knew exactly who she was. 
And he said, if someone owes 500 denarii and someone owes 50, and you forgive both, which shows the great gratitude? And he said, well, I presume the one who was forgiven the 500. And he answered once, she has seen much. So she's forgiven much. And he who was the holy the thou remained, well, in the same state he was before. But there is something odd deeper than what I just did, which we'll touch on on Monday. You can't stop the flow of tears at a certain level of awakening. You can't do it. You just can't do it. And well, I can't go into it now, it's a long one. But the harlot, the play the part of the harlot, as you're told in the book of Deuteronomy, your time has come to speak with your fathers, he's speaking now to Moses. In other words, it's a beautiful little form. Death. Time to die now. After you depart, they have no visible leader. They're all now so much present and play the heart with the strange gods of the land where they go to be among. And they will simply forget my covenant, and in that day I will hide my face from them. Hide his face from everyone who sees an underdog. Therefore the man who is not at seeing the risen Christ is still serving, but he knows not a false God. When I turn to the one true God, for then he will unveil himself and embrace me. I have returned, having prayed the heart, for we all pray the heart. But even to the part of playing that form of sin, which is called in scripture just the word sin. But it means one who has gone astray sexually with him. And he called it a sort of woman. But he was a friend of the sinner. He was a friend of the tax collector. And they called him a wine river and a drunk. That's why if a man is just a man, they can't believe for one moment that the cold drama has told him that he needs. For they know it is. And he loves the sinner. Who else would he help? He came not to serve and to save the right. They have no need to save him. They are so right, their own mind is right. They know that because they have money, that they go before God, they can say, I have to pay the dollars behind. In church, and I should charge him to look at me. And he said, I do not know you. I do not know you. The old story in the temple. I am so grateful that I am not as that sinner. While he asks for the gift, the sinner knows them. So the eyes of God, all gifts, all things will be forgiven. If you play the part of the prostitute from now to the end of the day, all forgiven. And those who have not themselves so pure, so altogether good. That they even could not perform violence upon themselves, so they could not perform it. Who does it? But she went astray and played the part because of what? Excessive love. Excessive passion. But God is all power. No condemnation whatsoever. Now, so he came among the sinners. And the one who saw him at the end was the one who said the part of that kind of thing, the prophet. He appeared to her first and appeared to her last. And she came in unannounced to the banquet and she washed his feet with her tears. So when they complained, you know, no one saw the man, saw the woman she is. And she washed my feet. Anymore, so much, right? Is that not customary? 
it is an ordinary man and not using words. Time to give him water. She gave it as she watched it. With her fear that the test was fast. That began 